Good afternoon. Welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's talk gardens. We are excited and that's the Imperial we because today I'm your speaker. So my name is Cindy Brown. I am the collections education and access manager at Smithsonian Gardens. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, seed saving. I worked in kitchen gardens and edible gardens for years. So for me, one of the most important things was to learn how to save seed from the heirlooms that I grew. It is something that really can be beneficial. And so we're going to look at it today and talk about some of the topics that go along with it. And I'm really excited because some of the illustrations that you'll see in this presentation are from our Archives of American Gardens. Archives of American Gardens is a, a collection of wonderful images uh, from different horticultures, from uh, gardens all across America, but also within the archives, we have images that help with PowerPoints, presentations, something like this, so that you can use these images when you need to express something that occurred in American Gardens. And I'm thrilled to be able to show some of those images, as well as some of the artifacts that we have in our artifact collection. So we're going to jump right into the session today. And at the end, I'll come back on. I'll make my chat box uh, pop up again so that I can answer your questions about seed saving. This is really fun for me to do both, but a little bit scary too. So thank you for your patience uh, for uh, working with me uh, for being both moderator and presenter today. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. in just a minute. <laughs> and we are going to learn all about seeds and how you might. Now this is part two so that you can, uh, you've already seen Philip Evich's presentation on seeds. So you've seen what seeds look like. You've seen how you can recognize the seed. You can see different times of the years when the seeds come are ripe that you'll be able to harvest. So this is a practical look, you know, how do you actually do the seed saving and what is the history behind seed saving? And so that's what we're going to look at today and be able to help you out, make the decision if seed saving is really something that you want to do. Something that I hear from all the time is why should we save seed? You know, it's so easy to order something or to go into a store and buy some seed. Why should we save seed? There are many different reasons, but one of the reasons I think is the most important is you really get to understand the plant better if you see it in its full cycle. If you save that seed from a plant that's one of your favorites and you watch the plant as it grows so that it's going through uh, like this, the seeds coming up and the cotyledons, the little seed leaves are coming out of that. And then you know when it's getting ready to bloom, you're watching for the bud, and then you're finally watching for the ripe seed to be able to occur. To me, it's almost magic. I, I know there's a lot of signs behind it, but when you're watching this, it is a way to understand plants better. So I hope that's one of the reasons, and I hope that's something that you've considered about learning more about plants from seed saving. Many people think that seed saving is done to save you money. I agree with that in certain conditions. The seeds that you collect and that you can direct sow, which means you can take it from the seed and whether you're storing it over the winter or not, uh, you can go ahead and plant that and you don't have to do anything with it. If you're collecting seed and you are, oh, full screen. Ah, I will go full screen then. Uh, actually, I'm not worried. We're going to go ahead. I have Zach on the other side that's helping me out uh, with uh, 
the presentation today. So he says that you can see my bar. I'm not going to worry about it right now. I don't want to stop and, and move forward on that. But back to seed saving. So if you, like I said, if you direct seed, it will save you money because it's something that you're already growing or a friend is growing and you can collect those seed and you can direct sow and there's no in between. When you save the seed and if you're trying to, like I do, grow my tomatoes from seed. So in that case, now I am trying to, I have a bank of lights that I use. I um, have to buy soil. I have to plant them. I'm using electricity. You may not be saving as much money as you think. Now, if you're going saving a lot of seed and growing a lot of plants, then yes, you're going to save uh, money to be able to do it. But the most uh, important thing that I think of, it doesn't save money, but it does help you increase the content of your garden. So the seed that you're getting from your neighbors, now you're able to grow larkspur or sunflowers or something in your garden that you wouldn't have had available before. And so to me, that's probably more important than saving money, but that's just me. You might see it as a great way to be able to save money. It may be a way, and you may be saving seed, to be able to save a favorite heirloom. An heirloom plant is one that if you save the seed from something like a uh, brandy wine tomato, you know that that seed is going to be fairly true to uh, whatever you uh, saved from the parent. And so, it's called open pollinated and that way it means that it will come true to whatever its parent is. Why would you want to save heirloom plants? Well, an heirloom plant from where it's grown is resistant to the local diseases and insects because it's been grown in that spot for years after years. And the seed was saved because that was one of the best uh, producers in that area. It's adapted to local climates and soil conditions. It's also something special, a reminder of our past. But do realize that an heirloom seed is one that is resistant to the diseases and the insects in the area that it was cultivated. Not necessarily if you pick up a seed that was saved from Arizona and it's an heirloom plant from Arizona, a uh, different zone from where we are in Washington, DC, it may not have the same resistance to our diseases and our insects, and it will not be acclimated or adapted to our soils and our climates in this area. So heirlooms are always a way to be able to save a living reminder of the past, but it may not have the disease resistancy that it would from where it was cultivated. Saving genetic diversity. That is a very important reason to save seed. There are so many seeds that are out there for so many different types of both species and cultivars to have those saved and not lost uh, for many reasons. It could, a seed could be lost to storms, something that's man-made, famine, so many different things, seed could be lost. And this is a great asset uh, to the world is this seed vault in Svalbard, Svalbard uh, Global Seed Vault. So if you speak Norwegian, I apologize for my mispronunciation of this wonderful seed vault, but it is in an area between uh, Oslo, Norway and the North Pole. And it was built to be kind of like a safety deposit box. It was built so that uh, other uh, seed saving and seed, seed collecting uh, groups could save their copies of their seeds, not copies in that it is a, a clone, but copy in that they have already have these seeds saved with their organization. And then there's a backup set that goes into the global seed vault that is ready to uh, uh, be made available to the organization that put the seed in there. So if you think of this as you're saving uh, uh, something in a bank uh, for uh, um, uh, a, a box, a safety box, that's what this 
uh, institution, the Seed Vault, was created for. And it is so important because there's so many different raw materials uh, that scientists need to be able to use for plant breeding. And to have this available, uh, have these seeds that are safe, uh, is, is just irreplaceable. Uh, the seed bank father was Kerry Fowler. He was an American that grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and he understood the importance of saving seeds and saving seeds in a um, safe spot and a climate controlled safe spot. And that's why it's in uh, the area between Norway and North Pole because it's built into a side of a mountain and it has uh, snow, it's cold. Uh, they're hoping that this is going to be a wonderful way of uh, protection for our genetic diversity throughout the years. Uh, it, it's an amazing place. So I added the uh, website so that you could read more about it. I hope you do because this uh, seed vault, it, they started out just by uh, saving seed from grains and from other edible uh, uh, foods, other edible plants but it also now saves quite a collection uh, from native plants to orchid seed so many different types of seeds have been added to the seed vault so the genetic genetic diversity in here is uh, an asset for the world maybe you want to save seed because you want to create the newest and best cabbage or the newest and best uh, daylily. And this is something that's really fun to play with. This is something that if you want to understand how uh, adding the pollen from one uh, cultivar to another cultivar and what you're going to come up with, this is a really fun way to play around. And this is something that's been done for hundreds of years so that we do have all the different cultivars available, not just for edible plants, for, but for all other types of plants that are out there too. So it's fun. I don't think many of us are going to go into that business, but who knows? You might uh, figure out that you are amazing at growing daylilies and being able to uh, cross pollinate and create a new daylily that's gonna just be the star of daylilies that year. So have fun with it. I'm a, a student of the 70s and there was a real uh, promotion, a real surge in this need to be self-sufficient uh, and, and self-sustainable. And, with gardening uh, uh, in particular, but it could be for many other reasons. But the whole idea that saving seed will help you be self-sufficient. The plants that you're growing, you are, are collecting the seed from and you'll be able to grow again. You do not have to go out and purchase anything. You do not have to rely on a, a commercial entity to be able to provide seed for you. So that's something that really uh, would help you be more self-sufficient. This is very much in tune to what happened during the Victor Garden uh, time period, both wars and, and many other times, like I said, in the 70s as well, when we went back to the garden and went back to uh, uh, our self-sufficiency roots. And something that I think is important to learn about. So in case you want to be more self-sufficient and you want to have that satisfaction of being able to provide for yourself and your family. In that case, you've really got to start to learn more about seed saving because it is one of the ways that you're going to be able to do it. Uh, the self-sufficiency really helps out in times of uh, trouble, in times of uh, uh, conflict, because then you can feel like you're doing your part. Uh, to, it, that's what happened in the Victor Garden time period because uh, many people, uh, the, the food that was grown in farms uh, were shared with our allies as well as our troops. And so it was a big push for Americans and uh, many others to be able to grow plants to be able to feed themselves. And so that was really uh, an important part of feeling connected to be able to help out in these uh, times of conflict. So self-sufficiency could just be for fun, but it also could be able to uh, help out in, in challenging times. Also, some of the seed may not be commercially available. Uh, you may have 
uh, a seed from your grandfather or great grandfather or great grandmother that is just not available anymore. I included this picture of this white plume celery because this celery was the thing to have uh, during uh, the late 1800s. It was a celery that was so important that people actually raised it and gave it to each other as Christmas presents, if you can imagine, holiday presents. Uh, and it was the the perfect celery to be able to serve in high-end restaurants. I looked in many modern catalogs. I could not find white plume celery anymore. It's fallen out of favor. And one of the reasons is because it doesn't really store very well. So you, it'll store up to the holidays and then it just disintegrates. Uh, so it's something that maybe you have a seed that means something to your family and it's not available any place anymore. So I think that would be a really important reason to be able to save the seed. Uh, and I hope someone has white plume celery out there because at one point in my life, I'd really like to grow it and see how it was so delicious that you would like to be able to share it as a Christmas present or as a gift to someone else. Okay. So those are some of the reasons that you might want to save seed. You may want to think of other reasons to be able to save seed, but I, I send me an, uh, an email and let me know one of the reasons that you would like to save seed uh, so that we can learn more about what makes us do this great endeavor. So let's now jump into how do you save seed? What is it that you can do to be able to save it? The most important thing to know is what do you have? What is the scientific name of what you have? Now, this is important because um, there's so many plants that have uh, broad uh, uh, members of their family uh, to be able to go along. So you want to know what you have so that you can uh, know how to save it and then how to grow it. Uh, there are many different seeds that are, um, I'll say it, promiscuous, that are within the same species and they're easily uh, crossbred within that species. Uh, something that we all know, if you have a compost pile, you may uh, uh, add to your compost pile and then next year you have a surprise coming up and you're trying to figure out, well, I did grow this type of, veg, of, of uh, squash and I did grow this type of squash but it doesn't look like anything that I grew it looks like perhaps a squash in between so you want to if you want to save seed for a specific type of squash uh, uh, Kirkabit pipo is uh, uh, one of the squashes that we really like to save seed from our summer squashes uh, uh, there are many other different types of uh, kirkovits that you can save seeds from, squash that you can save seeds from, but you want to know what that is so that you can make sure that you keep some space separated, that you know how much space you want to keep separated from the different squashes. You want to know if okay if you have a pipo squash or a maxima squash they're not going to uh, interbreed so you can safely grow both of those types together the scientific name is going to be your clue to all of this so start to investigate start to find out what scientific names you have in your garden before you save the seed is growing something from seed the best way to propagate maybe you're going to go through the effort to save seed but it might be easier to be able to grow those plants from divisions uh, maybe air layering maybe uh, uh, layering on the soil uh, maybe rhizomes might be the best way to save it and that's something that you should learn about too that's something that you should uh, look at and figure out are people taking divisions from this plant, this type of plant? And that's much easier to be able to get to grow, uh, uh, to have a fuller plant quicker. Or maybe you're taking cuttings from a plant. And that's the easiest way because the cutting is going to be, you're able to be able to grow something that will come true to whatever the parent plant is. 
I like to experiment a little bit. I like to save seed from irises that I grow. Uh, and it takes much longer for that iris that I save the seed from to be able to get to the point that it's going to be something that you recognize as an iris. Something I really have fun with is saving the little bulbules, the little seeds from um, lilies because I, I have a collection of lilies and when I go around and visit friends and I see they have a lily that I don't recognize, I save the seed from it. I ask them and so it may take five to six years before that lily gets to the point that it's going to bloom in my garden. But it's a fun thing for me to do. So is it the best way to propagate the plants? No, but it could be a fun way to be able to propagate it. So investigate what is the best way to propagate the plant that you want to grow. And then you have to understand, well, botanically speaking, is this plant an annual, a biannual, or a perennial. And you have to know the difference between those. I'm sure many of the gardens out there, gardeners out there can, can define those. You know that an annual is a plant that grows up in one year, goes to flower, goes to seed, that's it, kaput. But realize that some of our annuals are actually tropical plants and they're not botanically considered or classified as an annual. Botanically, they may be a biannual or they may be a perennial. So determine is this a true annual or is this something that I'm growing that in the area that it is native to would be a perennial. I'm thinking something like a canna or a, there are many other plants out there that we grow that are truly perennials but we may not be able, but or it's only an annual for us because of our climate. I found that out when I lived in Key West, which is much warmer than Washington, D.C., and I had tomato plants for two years. And this is before I, I received my degree, and all of a sudden I'm going, oh, now I get it. And I did the research and I realized that tomatoes are truly a, a perennial plant from where they are native to. Uh, only in our areas, many areas, that it is an annual because we don't have the climate to be able to support uh, the tomatoes growing year round. So it's something fun to look into. The other thing is saving seeds from biannuals, you have to know uh, when, when is it going to flower? Uh, what Do I have to do anything to be able to save it, to overwinter it? Uh, these are important questions because uh, if you're going to grow something like a cabbage, you have to go to extra lengths. A cabbage is going to come up and it's just going to be herbaceous uh, the first year that grows. And that's okay because that's what we want to eat is the cabbage, is just the leaves, the herbaceous part of it. And really the cabbage head, uh, if, if you want to overwinter it so that you actually will be able to grow seed from it, you're going to have to figure out a way to keep that alive over the winter. So in our area, there's certain cabbages and I we're in a zone a 7A or 7B here. Uh, the cabbages, some of them do overwinter. And so you can just go ahead and leave them in the ground, maybe mulch them a little bit heavier or uh, maybe uh, do some extra conditions to be able to keep them alive, put uh, cold frames over it or put uh, uh, cloth over it to be able to keep it alive over the winter. And then you can go ahead and let it go to seed in the next spring. And that's what will happen. The cabbage all of a sudden, once it starts to warm up, the cabbage head will split open and the flower stalk will come out of it and then it'll go to flower and then it will go to seed. Now, if you live in an area that cabbages, or maybe you have a cabbage that isn't as hardy that you want to save seed from, you've got to go ahead and bring that cabbage in for the winter. And I've done it before. It's a lot of fun. I, I don't know if I would do it on a regular basis, but if you were a farmer back uh, early in our history and uh, seed uh, catalogs were not around yet, you would have to do this. So you would bring uproot the cabbage, uh, hang it upside down in a, a cool area, say a, a root cellar. Um, uh, many people still do have root cellars that you could put a cabbage head in. And then you would have to replant it 
next spring and keep it watered in order for it to do its full uh, biennial uh, production to be able to have seeds from. So that's something you can try. It is fun to be it's just be able to see how to do it. Uh, you can tell I like to experiment and I like to know more about the full cycle of a plant so that I can encourage people to uh, experiment and do things outside the box. You have to remember though that you want to save seed from the best plants. So say you're growing tomatoes and you have these wonderful tomatoes uh, but you want to eat those because they're, they're, they're the ones that look the tastiest and, and you, you can't even bear the idea to be able to uh, let that tomato rot and, and let it go to seed so that you will be able to save those. But you actually really want to save seed from the very best plants that you have, the bare, very best fruit that you have that's available because that will give you the best seed to be able to carry along uh, uh, in the genes uh, from one year to the next. So you want to save seed from your best plants. You also want to save seed from multiple plants from what you're growing, multiple plants within the same species from what you're growing so that you can uh, plant them out the next year and continue having the most viable uh, the most healthy, hardy fruit or healthy, hardy plant that you're growing from. So think about picking the best out of this collection, not just something that, oh, I don't really want to eat this. It doesn't look very good. It doesn't look very tasty. So I'm going to go ahead and save the seed from this one since I don't want to eat it. No, nope. goes counter to what maybe our instincts are and what we want to do in the garden. Another thing to, to think about is when is the seed ripe uh, so that you know when you want to be able to save it. And this is where you have to do research. This is what helps when you grow the plants year after year and learn the life cycle so that you can determine when the seed is ripe. But when you first started to do it, um, the way that I used to tell at least in vegetables when the seed was ripe is it develops the hardness of a seed rather than if it still has too high of a water content, it means the seed is not ripe yet. It means the seed would mold or, or rot if you tried to save it. So you are actually looking for a seed with a low degree of moisture in the seed that's available and the seed is actually hard enough. Now, I'm saying that as an overall category, but there's some seed that you actually do want to plant when it's still got some moisture in it, when it's still a little bit soft. So that's where you have to do your homework and determine, okay, is this a seed that I want to plant that's still fresh, that's going to be best when it's still uh, a bit uh, uh, moist, uh, uh, young uh, off of the plant? Um, and, or is this a seed that I want to let totally dry on the plant and then save that seed and, and move forward from there. So at first it may be a challenge, but there's lots of information out there and I'll share some resources with you at the end of where you go to be able to determine is this seed one that I should wait till it's totally dry and save at that point? Or is this a seed that I still wanna save when it's still considered fresh and to be able to put in the ground uh, uh, immediately to be able to grow. So that is uh, something, a talent to work on, and that is something that uh, will offer some opportunities for you to be able to research for the specific type of plant that you wanna save seed for. When is it ripe? But for the most part, you're saving seed that is dry enough that can be stored and planted the next year. And then the other thing that's really fun. Well, what's the seed and what are the extra bits that I don't want to save? So you can see in this uh, image, in this slide, uh, you can see uh, some little bits and pieces of, of a plant, the little dark pieces that are around it. Um, most of them would have been formed on the end of the fluffy bits, as, as Philip said in his presentation. But it is very important to, to separate the seed from the chafe just because you want to make sure that those seed are going to be viable the next year. You don't want this extra bits and pieces uh, saved with your seed so that 
it co could cause the whole package to rot uh, and disintegrate. And you're going to be saving a lot of stuff. If you don't determine which is which, uh, you're going to be saving a lot of stuff that you don't need to. Uh, so look at it and figure out what is the seed and what is the extra bits that you don't want to, to have in your collection anymore. So uh, the flannel flower here, the seed is actually the little tiny bits, the dark bits that are in this image and the extra parts are uh, the seed covering the, the, the bits and pieces that would uh, help the seed move about uh, and fly, not truly fly, but move to a different area. And this is where it gets to be fun. Uh, and this is where if you're saving seed, you might want to buy some tools that are going to help you out. You may want to buy, and then this is a, an antique, a seed magnifier, but you may want to buy something that you can look at the seed closer so that you can determine uh, which is the seed and which is the shape to go along with it. Um, you also may want to buy uh, um, special seed uh, sifters that I'm going to show you more uh, um, about. And you're going to try to figure out how do you separate the different bits and pieces uh, for, for uh, what you're going to be using. Uh, so for dry processing, this is best, oh I'm sorry, uh, and this is one of the sifters that you could uh, purchase and it is uh, amazing help to you because you can have seed sifters that go down in size. This is really a screen that's placed in this hoop and the screen is going to be uh, have small enough holes that the chafe is not going to uh, go through but the seed will will fit through and the sifters are fun you can get them in all different screen sizes according to the size of the seed that you're working with and this is a really easy way to sift through the bits and pieces of what you have collected uh, and i've used one seed uh, sifter i've used uh, some of the sifters that you use for cooking with it just depends on what the size of your seed is. Uh, and then after you get your seed separated from the chafe down to the best possible way that you can, you can also use a piece of paper that you're folding and to be able to uh, put the seed on that and then very gently, very carefully tap the bottom of the paper to separate the seed because the seed's going to be heavier than the extra bits and pieces and you'll be able to sift it that way too so it's not really sifting it's more of a shaking but that works if you want to try it especially for larger seed that's an easier way to be able to separate the bits and pieces from the seed so a seed sifter a piece of paper that you've used uh, um, to be able to shake the seed away from the bits and pieces but and i'm going to go backwards one thing that you should realize when you're sifting this seed um, for bigger seed many uh, 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 seed collectors might use wind or uh, blow uh, use a fan to blow uh, air across a whole big area of seeds but if you're working with small seeds like this gentleman is here and this image you don't want any wind because you could be blowing your seed away uh, as well as the bits and pieces so think about the size of the seed that you have do you would a fan be easier to blow away the bits and pieces with or is it much easier just to sift and in a, a totally quiet place well, quiet meaning no wind uh, place so that you'll be able to not blow all of your hard work away when you're sifting the seed that's happened to me before too so it is a fun thing so seed cleaning you could be seed cleaning with dry seeds and dry material and a, a seed that you're going to collect uh, as a dried material you can let that seed totally dry on the stem like is in these delphiniums and these iris seeds so you would just let the the plant the this seed stalk stay up the flower stalks stay, stay up and then harvest it when it's totally dry. You want to harvest it carefully though because when you're letting it dry this much, it may then shatter. Um, the seed heads may shatter and distribute the seeds in areas and you would lose the seed that you're saving. Uh, so what I like to do if I'm uh, drying something, often I will collect it right before it's totally dry and I will put it the, the heads 
of the uh, seed pods in a paper bag and dry it inside so that the seeds are collected that way and they end up in the paper bag then shattering all over uh, my garden and spreading the seeds uh, that way in the garden. So this is a really easy way to gather seed and many of our perennials and our native plants you would be able to uh, gather seed this way from dried uh, seed heads. And there is a, uh, um, I, and I've given uh, credit to Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, there are materials that are out there that are going to help you determine is this best to grow, uh, to grow and collect uh, dry seeds or is it best to grow and collect as a wet seed? So Southern Exposure Seed Exchange have these seed saving guides available, but there are other places that have it too. So uh, investigate, uh, do some research to find out if, if someone has already done the work for you to tell you when to harvest it. Uh, it's a fun way to see uh, what's available out there and uh, learn from other people as well. So you could go to a resource, but the resource could be a living resource. You could talk to people that uh, do this, uh, other uh, gardeners, and maybe they've been doing it for years and you can learn from them as well. Then there's seed cleaning that is called a wet extraction. And many of our plants are like this. Think about when you, and we're getting up to a Halloween when we're going to clean out our pumpkins. And when you clean them out, there are all these group, uh, goopy uh, uh, mass of seed and uh, threads and all that that are in that pumpkin that you're cleaning out. And that would be considered wet cleaning so that the seed itself is mixed with all these wet materials that go along with it. So that's fun though too. And it takes a little bit more work, but it's still easy to do. Clean the seed off the best that you can. Uh, go ahead and wash it off and then go ahead and put the seed not on paper towels because they stick very easily to paper towels. And in a pumpkin, it wouldn't matter so much, but say you have a, a seed that you've washed and they're little seed and they're sticking to the paper towel, it's a little bit harder to extract. So it's important to, uh, to put the seed on something like wax paper that's not going to stick uh, to the seed and then it's going to be easier to remove the seed from that wax paper and then uh, take the process further from there. So wet seed is still very easy to do. Uh, and there are many things that you can uh, work with, like a pumpkin and squash, that is a, an easy way to get seed from. And here is a list of different plants that are considered wet seeds that you can uh, collect and uh, uh, wash and do all that. Now, there is a, a specific type of seed cleaning called fermentation. And this is important for many of those wet seeds that I just showed you, including tomatoes. And you want to ferment the tomato seeds and often the cucumber seeds to be able to uh, go through a process that will uh, eliminate any of the viral, uh, the viruses that are hanging on to those seeds that may have been uh, uh, cultivating in the fruit as it was growing. Uh, also bacteria. So fermenting is a real fun thing to do to be able to save seed. So from a tomato, you're going to want to be able to collect the whole tomato, goopy and all, scoop out that, you know how the tomato has the goopy part that's inside of it. So you're going to scoop it out. You're going to put it in a container and you're going to put cheesecloth over top of it so that you don't create anaerobic conditions. Uh, that's still gonna, the seed's still gonna have uh, air that's gonna be circulating within it. And then you're gonna sit it outside. Don't do this inside. It really smells bad. Um, so you're gonna let it sit outside for a couple days and it's gonna bubble, it's gonna smell really gross, uh, but you want it to do that so that you are effectively cleaning the seed to be able to save it. So after it ferments for a couple days, you're going to be able to uh, scoop off the seed from the top of it and, and the materials, so not just seed, but what floats to the top are, are the seeds that aren't viable, it's all that gooby stuff that is coming off of it. The seed that you want to save or the seed that is sink to the bottom. Uh, the viable seeds sink, the 
extra stuff floats to the top. So you're going to scoop off the extra stuff off the top, save the, the heavier seeds that are on the bottom, and then go ahead and wash it off and dry it from there. So don't dry them in the direct sun though. Uh, when you're drying seed of any type, in, including uh, these seeds that have gone through fermentation, make sure you put the seed to dry in a shady spot so that you're not causing them to germinate again. Uh, you want that seed to save, not, not germinate when it's still uh, uh, fresh and coming out of it. Probably the most important thing to do is to keep good records for the seeds that you save. Many seeds look alike, and if you don't say uh, uh, what that seed is, so uh, uh, you want to you want to keep records of when you harvest it. That's going to help you year after year, so that you don't have to second guess again. Because eventually you're going to say, "Oh, I harvested this after the seed after the fruit had grown." Uh, for eight weeks. I'm making this up just, you know, it's going to be different for everything, but you know, it took eight weeks for this seed to come to the point that I would be able to save it and, and move on from there. Uh, you want to uh, um, say when the seed was stored because some seed is not viable after a couple of years. Some seed has a very short lifespan. Parsnips, onions, they all have short lifespans as a seed. So put mark on your container uh, when you when you stored those seeds, when you harvest it, when you stored them. The physical characteristics, now this may sound weird, but uh, you want to mark down what that plant looked like. What does that fruit look like? Because maybe it does cross. Maybe something has happened in your garden and you are crossing plants. So you want to know what that seed is supposed to look like when it grows, uh, when it matures and what the plant should look like and what the original source was. Say you save seed and for some reason your whole uh, seed collection was ruined. So you want to be able to go back and buy that seed again from your original uh, source or get it from the person that you, you saved it from. And then more history or culture for the seed. Seed storage. So now you've saved it. Now you need to know how you're going to keep it safe. And seed storage is an art. Uh, you're going to, many people have different ideas. What's worked best for me is to be able to put the seeds that you're saving, you let them dry uh, to uh, a, 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 um, a level that is a dryness that's appropriate. And then I like to put them in uh, coin envelopes, the little envelopes that you can get. And then I can write right on the coin envelopes. Now, because you want your seed to be dry, but you don't want it to be so dry it's not viable anymore, what I have been doing is putting that uh, coin envelope in another container, maybe uh, a, a plastic container or like that's on the far right, the picture that's on the far right, maybe a wooden box. And then I store them in the refrigerator. Why the refrigerator? Because it keeps, it is a climate controlled uh, storage place. And so that I'm putting the seed in the corn envelope, I'm putting it in another container so that it keeps the level of moisture good for the seed that I'm growing or that I'm saving. And then I put it in the refrigerator so it is temperature controlled as well. And mm, the refrigerator should be about 40 to 45 degrees. Uh, and that has always worked for me. Now, you see in the many of the uh, um, seed collecting uh, organizations, they freeze the seed. And that's something that you can do if you can reliably get a seed down to a dryness level about 8%. Because if you can't get the, or yeah, moisture level, I'm sorry, not dryness level, moisture level to about 8%. Because if you don't get that moisture level down that low, then just like when our plants go, are experiencing fall conditions and winter conditions and it freezes and thaws, it breaks the cell walls and it will break the cell walls in your seeds and then the seeds won't be viable anymore. So as a home seed saver, I have never frozen my seed. Commercial, they have the uh, tools to be able to get the seeds down to a moisture level that is not going to cause the seed to break and disintegrate. 
So did I miss one in here? Yes. Okay. So there's controversy about what's true to type. Do you want your seed to come true to whatever you're, you're saving uh, from the parent plant? Well, maybe not. Maybe you want something that's going to be so specific to your area and grow so well in your area, you're going to grow the seed and you're going to keep on saving the seed that has done best to your area. In your case, I've put, uh, uh, in that case, then it would be considered a land race. So I put these terms up on this slide and we'll be willing to share this with you afterwards. I'll make a resource page that will go on our website. And a, a land race is something that is a, a vegetable, a fruit, a plant, whatever it may be, that was developed over a long period of time in one area so that it stays, it, it, it's the best type of uh, seed or best type of plant within the species that's going to be true to the climate for which it's been grown in. Heirlooms, as we already know, they're similar to land races in that they've been grown for years in a specific area, but an heirloom then is something that's been taken sometimes out of the area that's been growing. So all those plant heirloom seeds that you're buying now is uh, a plant that is not going to be uh, a land race, considered land race anymore, because it may have been grown in another area. And now we're trying to grow the plant that was raised in, like I said before, Arizona in the Washington DC area. So it's no longer considered a land race, but it's still an heirloom because it grew up in one area. It was, it was bred in one area for a long period of time, but now it's uh, grown in an area that's not indigenous to uh, its uh, original area. And a hybrid is just, we won't even get into hybrids right now, but a hybrid is what we've done uh, uh, to be able to cross plants, to be able to select the best characteristics from each of the uh, uh, plant. Uh, and I'm saying plant, but it would still have to be a tomato <laughs> if you're going to save tomato seeds. But a hybrid uh, would be the best, uh, taking the best characteristics and crossing them over. Uh, the hybrids don't also always come true. Um, the, sometimes you get something that's really a throwback to one of its parents. So hybrids are a different group altogether. So here's how you can create your own land race, increase genetic diversity, save the seeds from the good plants, and intermingle the seeds that you've saved with seeds from the same variety that someone else has grown. A lot of fun if you want to consider growing something that is really hardy to your area. Okay, so seed saving was so important for so many years. It was the only way that our uh, farmers or our gardeners would have had the seed available uh, to be able to grow on the farms or in the gardens. And then all of a sudden we started to buy seeds from catalogs. So in the 19th century, uh, the seed industry replaced most grassroots seed saving practices rather than gardeners and farmers purchasing, I mean, uh, growing their own seed, it was much easier for them to purchase seed from seed suppliers. Why? Well, you've seen the work. That just took me 45 minutes, almost 50 minutes to describe how you save seed. It's really a time, a labor uh, a saving process to be able to save, buy seed from a seed company instead of uh, doing it yourself. And it can be cost effective because you're not spending as much time saving seed, you're spending the time growing seed. Also, in the 1800s, we had uh, such a growth within the United States. People coming from all countries and coming here and then going out. They might have saved some seed from their homeland, Many of people did. That's where heirloom seeds sometimes came from. But when you think about moving across country and settling in different areas, this mass migration, um, seed catalogs made seed available to a wider range of farmers and people that wanted to be able to grow things. We had, we never would have had enough local seed to be able to share with the people that came in from different areas. So one of the reasons it became so popular. 
seed boxes. I love these. You, uh, the seed companies would create these amazing collections of seed and then the whatever store, grocery store, wherever it is, would have been able to make these seed boxes available to them. And then at the end of the year, at the end of the growing season, the company or the, the store would send back the seed box and then the companies would refill them and put them out again. What a great way to be able to shave seeds. Seed saving and seed catalogs just grew. Uh, these seed catalogs and seed companies were so important. Uh, they were a big component of the world's uh, Columbian Exposition uh, so many years ago. This I think is fascinating. This is just a little bit of tidbit, great for a cocktail conversation. So these companies, uh, that, the seed companies that were selling seed, they needed ways to be able to encourage people to buy these seeds from them. So they created these trade cards, which we have many of them in our collection at Smithsonian Gardens. Uh, and the trade uh, um, cards were fun because these were like baseball cards. So it did have the information of the seed company on the back, but it exploded in popularity. So this would be like the early baseball cards or the early Pokemon cards, and people were doing their darndest to be able to save the seed or save the uh, trade cards and exchange them. And then catalogs, once the color printing and uh, uh, color printing became available, you now had the ability to see colors and why wouldn't you want to be able to buy from a colored uh, representation of the plant that you wanted to grow rather than something that's black and white and they became beautiful pieces of artwork actually and then you have testimonials so uh, burpee was very um, uh, good about this uh, so were many companies that uh, burpee would have these seed contest and these prize contests. Send me uh, a letter and tell me why uh, you like to grow our onions more than anybody else's onions. And these testimonials were so important because this added a voice from the, the gardener. This was a, an ability to communicate from gardener to gardener, an early way to communicate from gardener to gardener to say how important this seed was to them and their family. Um, what has happened with our collection of testimonials from these uh, contests, it is one of the best ways that we can get a look inside of the lives of women at that time because they were ones that would mostly tend the home garden and they would write in and they would talk about it. So this is a voice from women from a time when many women's voices were not captured in history. So it's a wonderful addition to it. Here's two resources that if you would like to learn more about seed saving, there are uh, resources that have helped me through the year and uh, through the years, and I think you would really uh, enjoy this, this. I'm going to stop sharing. I apologize. We will have the names of this in the chat box, but we have a couple minutes left, and I really want to be able to answer some of these questions that are on. So Zach, will you let me know that uh, you can see my screen okay again? Uh, yes, your video is showing up fine. All right, thank you. I appreciate this. So we have a couple questions that are in here. I unfortunately can only see, and this is something I didn't think about, Zach, um, I can only see the <laughs> last questions that were uh, put up on board because I can only see what was asked after I stopped sharing the screen. So if you could help me out here and ask some of the questions. I'll be glad to answer uh, for the next couple minutes. Sure thing. Um, Thank so you. the first question we had come in was from Carol Edwards and she asked, can you share any organized efforts to save historic seed from plants that were grown in the US by marginalized people, those who face discrimination by the ag agricultural community, land grant universities and the US government? So thinking about African Americans, American Indians, mm -hmm. Latinx Americans, et cetera. Yep. Actually, no, I don't know of any sources. I know of the major sources that seed saving is being done, but that's a really good question. And that's something I will have to re re research and uh, I will do the research and I will put it up on our resource page for the seed saving uh, uh, webinar when it's put up on our website. That's a very good question. Uh, I know that there are uh, 
many seed saving organizations and many of them are based on a very specific topic but i will get back to you on that that's that's a great question thank you zach and carol um, and the next question was also from Carol. Um, how do you know what the moisture level of your dried seed is? Is there a way to measure accurately for the home seed saver? There are. There are tools that you can use and you can buy them from seed catalogs to be able to check the uh, moisture level in a seed so that you know what you're saving at. It's um, uh, based on hydraulic, uh, the hydraulics of the seed, not hydraulics in, in the way that you're doing water control or anything, but it is going to be able to measure the level of moisture in it. And so I will find the name and I will put that up on our resource page too. Thank you. Own oh, stratification. I can see that one. So uh, can you talk about stratification and when you refine the requirements for the specific seeds? The resources that I shared with you are going to tell you if a plant or if a seed needs to be stratified, if a seed needs to be fertilized, and if a seed needs to be scarified. Uh, so many of our plants that uh, that we save or many of our seeds that we save do have to go through one of those processes because you think about it in nature a seed is going to be dropped at a certain time of the year and many of our native seeds are going to be dropped at this time of the year and they have to go through um, a vernalization period so they have to go through a period of freezing and thawing so that this the seed coat can be broken uh, the uh, um, the triggering of the formation of the roots can start and many of our seeds start growing roots before it starts growing tops so the vernalization period is very important for many of our seeds scarification is because that seed coat has to be broken open somehow before it will allow the seed to be grown. And the scarification is mimicking the normal process for the seed will go through. Think about it. When a bird eats a seed, it's going through uh, the bird's digestive system. And in that system, uh, it will the seed will be scarified. It will be uh, broken down a little bit. So when it goes through the bird system and it's planted, <laughs> um, then you will have the um, seed uh, able to start growing because that seed coat would have been broken and uh, uh, enable the, the growth to occur a little bit better. So all those uh, resource, uh, the resources that I shared with you will have that information that's available as to what it has to go through. There are many other resources out there and many of the seed catalogs will tell you as well, not necessarily the uh, most, uh, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm not going to go into it. I, I can't uh, recommend too many different uh, seed catalogs. So if you want to recommend uh, in the chat box with each other, that's great. Make sure you just share it with everyone uh, to go along with it. But uh, let's see what else is on there. We have any other questions, Zach, that I'm missing? Uh, we had one that just came in. Why are seeds stored in the freezer not viable, both native seeds exposed to frozen temps Oh, but native seeds exposed to frozen temperatures outside are okay. So not, not when you save seed in the, in the freezer, it has, you have to make sure that the moisture level is down low enough in nature. That's going to occur normally. So if a seed is growing in our area for native plant and it, native, native plants, and it has to get down to that moisture level, then it's going to follow our climate conditions, see if this makes sense. It's going to drop at a certain time period so it has enough time to be able to get to its dryness level or not dryness level um, if it still wants to be moisture like a pawpaw wants to be moist when that seed is planted. Um, the native plant is growing in the area that recognize, recognizes uh, the time period when it's best to drop and it's not going to do, be the same process is automatically quickly putting it into a freezer before it's gotten to the point that it's dried out enough that it's safe to go through the freezing and thawing if that makes sense hopefully i'm looking to see if they ask again oh and eric is adding things too so play with it one thing that I have learned is when you're vernalizing seed and you want to do it outside, I've never done it in the refrigerator. I always uh, have tried to grow my seed outside so that it goes through the normal conditions that it would and that is in the best environment for it to grow. But 
when you have seed outside that's available, there are critters that are going to come to be able to eat the seed because it's a it's like a bank, a, a restaurant for them to come in and eat all these seed that you're trying to store and uh, exposed to the right conditions. So please make care to be able to protect that seed. Uh, have screen underneath the soil that you're growing it in. Have it in a box like a cold frame with screen or whatever uh, to be able to keep the critters out and just take extra precautions to be able to protect that seed. Uh, you can grow them in pots but make sure that you're growing the pots in perhaps a screened container so that uh, the critters can't get to that seed. There's so many other questions. Please go ahead and email. Uh, I get emails from people every week to be able to follow up on questions that they have, and I'm glad to answer them uh, and share them with you. But it's one o'clock, and I thank you so very much for joining me today. This is, I, I told Zach at the beginning of the, the session that I really like to talk about these um, very specialized topics because this is the heart of horticulture and this is heart of uh, gardening is to be able to learn these topics that get down into the weeds a bit and then give you enough information that you can go and research research and learn more and become a gardener that's going to be able to handle so many different wonderful explanations in the gardening world thank you and i i appreciate your support and we'll see you next week bye, -bye.